Okay, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to episode two of Breaking the Chains, Atram's exclusive webinar interview series with some of the top business minds in the country. Today, we will be welcoming the Chief Financial Officer of International Container Terminal Services Incorporated, or ICTSI, Mr. Joel Kunsing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you may ask questions throughout the discussion by clicking on the Q&A button on your screen. We will get to as many questions as we can at the end of the discussion. Additionally, I'd like to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and that copies will be disseminated within the day as well as posted on all our social media pages. Now, to introduce today's moderator, as Atrum's Head of Equities, he oversees the management of domestic equity portfolios, spearheads the development of Atrum's equity investment process, and periodically shares the firm's outlook on the asset class. However, today, he will take charge of hosting the interview with Mr. Kunsing. Let me now hand the floor over to Mr. Julian Tarabago, Jr. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, us today uh, in this very, especially during this very interesting time with our very special featured guest. So to say this, this uh, period is interesting is a huge understatement. This for me is one of the four most extraordinary stock market events in my 25 year career, uh, following of course the 1997 Asian financial crisis, the 2001 tech bubble, and the 2008 global financial crisis, also known as the, the global credit crunch. Of the various lessons learned from, from these crises, um, one of the most important is that, oh, I think, is that during a crisis, you get bombard when you get bombarded with lots of news and lots of noise, you need to focus on the near term certain the near certain things in the highly uncertain market so in our view these are the near certain things so cars if you could put up the slide first is let's not kid ourselves uh, expect more bad news to come and more volatility in the market with um, pretty much philippine gdp growth and corporate earnings growth likely to be wiped out in the second quarter after already falling by about 20% for, for uh, Philippine corporate earnings in the first quarter of 2020. We also don't rule out uh, a scenario wherein you have extended lockdowns, uh, bankruptcies, and, and defaults. Although this is, I want to reiterate, not in our base case scenario. Second cert near certain thing is that monetary and fiscal stimulus will continue and provide liquidity support to companies and to risk assets, such as Philippine equities. Combined with a rebound in corporate earnings, at least we anticipate a rebound in corporate earnings in 2021, combined with attractive valuations for the market uh, as we speak, um, some value plays out there already, quality plays, and combined with structural improvements, and I'm talking about lower corporate income tax rate, which I think will happen as soon as next month, um, the lifting of foreign, foreign ownership limits and the implementation of the real estate, uh, uh, tr real estate uh, trust, investment trust law or the REITs law. We believe these structural investments will be enough alongside, you know, uh, there seems to be some, some uh, well, optimism that regulatory uncertainties will likewise clear up a little bit. All of these will likely, in our view, um, allow foreign investments to come back uh, into Philippine stocks. Um, if you really, really think about it, if you look at over the next 12 to 24 months, we also think um, humans will either have developed a herd uh, immunity um, to the medical uh, uh, crisis that, that, that we have, or the medical issues, uh, there's something to the lockdowns, or there would be a medical solution um, already by in 12 to 24 months. So these near certain factors in this uncertain market support a recovery and a positive long-term outlook for both the PSEI and the economy. In the short term, we assume a gradual opening up of the economy with corporate earnings actually falling by about 25% this year, then rebounding in 2021 and delivering a PSEI target of about 7,431 points. That's about 17% from, uh, from yesterday's close upside, um, or about 16 times uh, 2021 PER. Uh, again, premised on foreign, foreign investments coming back in uh, as well. 
our strategy uh, is the same. We are keeping some cash due to uh, anticipated volatility ahead. And while selectively investing mainly in high quality blue chip uh, companies, trading at uh, significant discounts to our stress tested estimates of intrinsic value. So we took our intrinsic values, we stressed it, stress tested the intrinsic values in terms of volume, in, in terms of the period of recovery, and based on what we came up with as intrinsic value estimates for the companies that we cover, if the stock price is trading at a dis meaningful discount to that, then that is what we would consider uh, some value. So that's what we were trying to share here with you guys. So, so in this exercise, we're, we're actually seeing value emerge across industries. Uh, and one of these industries where we see value emerging is actually port services, um, where uh, we're actually seeing some recovery uh, in, in, in sales volumes for, for the ports as the global economy or global economies start to open up. Uh, ports uh, are a hub for shipping, which is the cheapest way to transport bulk goods worldwide. Uh, and because of that, it accounts for about 90% in terms of volume of goods traded globally. So um, that said, we are very, very fortunate to have with us one of the most astute, seasoned, and multi-awarded CFOs of this generation not of this year, of this generation. His name is Joel Consing. A lot of you probably know him already, of International Container Terminal Services, Inc., or ICT. That's the ticker in the PSEI. ICTI, or ICT, operates on the front lines of global trade with a portfolio of about 32 terminals in 18, 19 countries across six continents in both emerging and developed economies. Now, before joining ICT, Joel was an investment banker with HSBC and treasurer of a Boites and Company. Uh, yeah, so hi, Joel. Really happy hey. you joined us today. Thank you. And uh, congrats on the recent bond issue. And most of all, happy, happy 30th anniversary to ICTSI. I, said, I think it was this week or is it? Today. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. It's our 32nd anniversary. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And uh, you know, uh, to all those uh, watching, um, uh, hello to all. And I, I really hope that uh, everyone is safe um, and uh, similarly for your respective families. Uh, thank you for inviting me. You're welcome, Joel. I'm very excited to discuss or to, to learn from you and to have a discussion about what the opening up of global economies actually mean but before we get down to business, let's do a, a, maybe a quick check-in. So, Joel, at this moment, what, what's most present with you? Uh, really good question. You know, from, from my perspective, really, just uh, taking a look at what's happening across the globe and similarly what's happening in our country. Um, and, uh, you know, when I have conversations with my kids, the question which we ask ourselves in a dinner table is, what can we do to help? Right? So, you know, they've got their own small projects. And, and, and in my case, I've got a very small personal movement that I started, which is what I call the consumption movement. Mm. You know, uh, because I, I, I think that um, the way out of this recession is consumption. And, um, and, and, and I think that those who can afford to spend, in my opinion, should, should be basically out there spending. Um, and, and that basically is my thesis. And I'm very excited about uh, what the prospect of that can do um, if this movement grows. And uh, again, really... Uh, if the more you spend, the more you keep people at work. And, and uh, I think it's as basic as that. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah. The, I, I'm a, I actually signed on to that, that, that movement, the consumption drive, and, and I encourage uh, everyone to, to check it out. I mean, Joel makes a lot of very good points there. Uh, and uh, before we get down into uh, the, the nitty-gritty, uh, I have a very important question for you, Joel. What is your daily GCQ or lockdown routine? Okay, well, it uh, hasn't really changed. Um, you know, I, I wake up really early. I, I guess as we get older, <laughs> we, we, uh, we, we uh, wake up super early. So I start off with, with meditation. You know, I do like 30 to 45 minutes of meditation. Then I work out. 
Um, during the ECQ, obviously, I couldn't do really anything. Uh, but under GCQ, uh, I, I, you know, we could run. We got access to a private gym, so that that really works out. And and the three doesn't change. Um, I, I probably now I do a little bit more meditation because I've got a little bit more time, <laughs> having spent so much wow. time at home <laughs> under ECQ. You know, so uh, and uh, some of the stuff that comes out, uh, like, like again, this movement, uh, it is basically wow out of out of, out of that. Woo! Starting off strong, Joe. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, m- m- wow. Meditation is a is such an important part of of my day uh, as well. It helps me um, connect and deep deep dive into myself, my my heart, and clears helps me clear the clutter in my head. Allows me to uh, know why I'm feeling certain things, and and in the process, helping remove or or take out the anxieties. And uh, yeah, basically relaxes me and, and gives gives me a lot of clarity, um, which is I think what we what we uh, what we really need, uh, especially nowadays. Uh, and and we'll plan to get more clarity from you today. Um, you and you pair that meditation with a, a good workout, man. That's a that's a powerful morning cocktail, uh, breakfast of champions. <laughs> I think so. Uh, I think, uh, I think Phil wants to ask a question before we, we proceed. Sure. Phil, did you want to ask him a? Yeah. Uh, hi, Joel. Welcome. Um, hey, morning, Phil. Thank you for thank you for joining us today. I don't want to. Uh, I want you to guys get going, but you know your your movement is touching me, and we need to figure out a name for this so we can go national. Maybe we get the uh, four hundred people on this chat to really recommend some names. And let's see if maybe by the end of this talk, we, we launch you nationally because this is powerful. My suggestion would be gastos para ganar. Yeah. <laughs> that's my <Spanish laughs> There you go. Anything man. Else. <laughs> but anyway, um, congratulations. Fantastic. And um, look forward to listening to you today and all the best. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. So thanks for that, Phil. Um, so be- before we go into... Uh, you and ICTSI. Um, let's talk about life before ICT, if I, ICTSI, if, if, that's, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Seems like you're, you're, you're an entrepreneur at heart or by heart. Um, there's this story about you I heard about uh, knocking on doors in Marikina to sell lexicon encyclopedias. So, I mean, what, what's up with that? Could you tell us? That seems like a... Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, thanks. So, so yeah, so, so um, you know, I, I guess driven by uh, economic circumstances, I, I did a lot of work when I was in college. So I was doing, you know, research work for this gentleman named Dr. Marita Vidaporta in, in school. And summers, I would, you know, do, do part-time work. And one of those that I applied for was to sell encyclopedias. Uh, I, I don't know if many people here, uh, here know what encyclopedias are in today's <laughs> age of Wikipedia, but uh, you know, this used to be a, a set of books um, called Lexicon Brand. And I used to go to Tai Tai Rizal. Yeah, uh, Tai Tai Rizal actually was what I, where I would walk because I was told that there's a lot of cash sitting in those homes. Uh, there's a lot of textile industry going on there. So I would walk and, and knock on doors and present. Right, um, and uh, I, I remember also uh, during the month, um, I, I, I won the mo- an award for having sold the most number of books. Uh, got a trip to Thailand, but instead of taking it, I surrendered uh, the ticket. Um, got the cash and plus that in, in, in the, uh, my commissions, and then I, I, I bought the APVC <laughs> and CPVC. No. Well, prior to Ayala Land, it was called Ayala Property Venture Fund. So that was a long time ago. Uh, and, and then the second one, the CPVC, and they merged the two into what is now Ayala Land. <laughs> so, so your 10 pesos so, turned into now <laughs> I don't know, really. <laughs> almost 40 pesos per <laughs> from your entrepreneurial mindset. So you, no, no, yeah, it's just, it's just, that was, yeah, so, so, that, so I I'm guess not, that was the start of it. No? I'm not sure if a lot of people know you're also a uh, venture capitalist and uh, one of the very first movers in, in, in the boom or gentrification of what is now the hip and tourism hub that is Poblacion. So I'm sure a lot of, uh, a lot of you guys uh, have heard or have been. 
uh, to Poblacion and Joel is like one of the early movers in that space. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about how much you bought your 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 your, your property in Poblacion, uh, but you can you can talk about it if you want. But could you talk about the vision and the I mean how I mean how of how an entrepreneur thinks because because that took some vision for you to to invest in in, in that space and it, to become what it eventually it has uh, become today, which is quite significant. No, thanks. Well, 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 you know, thanks for the credit, June, but, but really uh, that particular credit goes to my other partner, Ronald Barcegan. And then when we were conceptualizing it, um, and when he was conceptualizing it and he was speaking to me about it, uh, we, we felt that there was an opportunity, there was a big arbitrage sitting in Poblacion because on the one hand, uh, you've got very high prices um, in Ayala, Makati Avenue et al., and even in Rockwell, yet that area of Poblacion was, uh, I think, at the point in time, roughly about 30-40% of what the market was everywhere else. So we felt that at some point in time, it would gentrify and those prices would catch up. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and Rommel and his concept of putting up a hostel, and we then put up Z Hostel and in, in um, made it into what it is now. And, um, and one of the things that we did as well uh, with another company was we um, leased on a long-term basis many of the houses there, converted them, and then leased them out to restaurants. Right, uh, so that way we've got that control over the frontage of, over how it looks. Um, we also tried to curate as to who would be uh, locating there. So if you notice, we don't have the you know the more the more popular and common brands sitting in that area. Right, so they've really been curated, and we've uh, you know we organized uh, street parties at uh, just to get foot traffic in, and so much fun actually doing that. Yeah, yeah, and, I've uh, been there a few times, just a few times. <laughs> And I encourage everyone to actually come and visit us when, you know, when uh, in, in the next new normal, as we step into this next new normal. I'm curious, are there plans for Poblacion gentrification to like, uh, I mean, because uh, the, the, is, the, is the thinking it's going to go back to normal or is it going to be bigger, better, uh, more inclusive? I mean, what's, is there any um, thing happening in, in the Poblacion space that the you're That's a really good question. So, um, so you know, uh, I, I, again, as, as an organization, uh, before uh, it, it was um, yeah, there was really no organization amongst them, but now people are, uh, are are working with each other, finding solutions for how we can how we can elevate Poblacion again and get people to actually walk back in there um, post lockdown. Um, the, the reality is that you know we we are dealing because we're dealing um with with a pandemic uh, the reality is that the consumer psyche will really have to pivot eventually right from survival um to consumer confidence and and, and that'll take some faith and, and in addition to that um businesses themselves will have to adjust this new normal and and likewise calculate what the economics mean for them okay um and and similarly this lockdown uh, similarly presents to them uh, both challenges on one hand, but similarly opportunities on the other. Do they still need the same amount of space that they used to now that they've ready, for example, started developing um, a, you know, a, a, a takeout service, uh, for example, and thereby expanding their market? So I think it'll take time, right? And, 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 and therein also lies the case for why I don't think we're going to have a V-shaped type of recovery, in my opinion. Thank you for that, Joel. So... Yeah, kind of uh, excited to, to get back there as well. Uh, so ultimately, this entrepreneurial thinking, this mindset, uh, I'm shifting now into, into ICTSI. How has this entrepreneurial mindset helped you in your role as global CFO of ICTSI? Because you have to deal with a lot, not just here, but in emerging markets. Uh, and and uh, I'm, I'm curious, is there a connection that you can, uh, a common thread there that helped you uh, transition to a career in finance and, and eventually um, uh, in a leading uh, company, not just here, but overseas. Right, yes. Well, uh, certainly not. So um, I mean, just, just taking a look at my career, uh, you know, I've, I've done almost the entire gamut of banking, save for retail and trust. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, all those, uh, I would say 19 years of investment banking and in frontline relationship management experience, um, it all culminated, culminated into this role as treasurer and eventually CFO, our role at ICSI. So, you know, I, I, in every role that I took, I actually learned something and uh, really this is an amalgamation of all things. 
Now, uh, linking it to uh, to in being an entrepreneur, um, because you know, I'm, I'm also an investor in, in a large construction and IT service company. Uh, absolutely, right? Uh, because on one hand, um, you you understand how the SMEs work, and on the other hand, how the company deals with uh, with SMEs and, and how basically you can enhance that relationship. Um, and, uh, and, and and similarly on the other way around, right? So I e ask, um, I, I'm not an officer in, in those companies, I'm just an investor. Uh, but when I advise, for example, management, I'm able to take off from the experiences that I've had, for example, in ICTSI, uh, i.e., for example, those that we're doing now, all the um, you know, cost management approaches that we're undertaking right now. So I'm, I'm able to take a look at my, my own companies and say, on, on my side, what is it that we can do similarly? Right? So it, it's, it's almost a symbiotic relationship, really, uh, between the two. And in my opinion, it enhances my experience in either, uh, in, in both ways. It's, it, it's uh, I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Great. Uh, so uh, in, in past discussions, you also talked about uh, uh, one of the lessons. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, okay. So thank you for that. Uh, so before we go deeper into ICTSI, um, since I, I talked about us being in a, in a uh, well, uh, an extraordinary event, in my in the in the stock market, could you take us back to two thousand and nine? So we're going into ICTSI now. Um, could you talk about how that crisis was like for you and how you navigated uh, in the last big crisis that, that we had? And and uh, yeah, were there any lessons you, you gained from no, that? Thank you, thank you for that. And in the two thousand and nine is definitely the appropriate um, period with which to compare this. Um, I know that I know that there was Spanish flu before, but really no one knew what happened there. Uh, but in so far as experiencing a synchronized downturn in global trade, 2009 is definitely the comparable. The drivers, however, for why for for the costs of 2009 and now are very very different, and and therefore also in my opinion that would similarly drive the shape of our recovery. If you go back to 2009. Yes, there was a, global, a structural downturn in global trade, and that was really driven by a disruption on the demand side. But the demand side globally was really a function of a loss of confidence rather than a loss of liquidity. The only loss of liquidity was occurring in the U.S. where there was a housing crisis. But everywhere else, it was a function of, well, let's wait for a while. Let's not consume first. Let's wait for what happens in the U.S. before we start spending. And therefore, everyone held back. Okay. So thus, when, tw when, when, when governments across the globe coordinated with their respective qualitative easing uh, mechanics and programs, um, confidence came back. And across the globe, there was um, an exuberance and an excitement. And therefore, it was easy for them to spend. And that's why you see a, a mm -hmm. V-shaped recovery yeah. in 2010. It's different now. Now, the disruption came first from the supply side that's coming from China. And then you now occur, uh, and, and then uh, after which occurred a disruption on the demand side, except the, the, the disruption on the demand side is structural. It's not just a matter of losing confidence, but it's, but it's people losing jobs. It's, it's the country losing its tourists, right? right? It's, it's you and me mm. spending less as a result of the lockdown. Right, um, and uh, that therefore will take a little bit more time to recover, in my opinion, as compared to 2010. So very, very structurally different things. Now, um, the from from my CSI's perspective, um, I, I guess fortunately it, it it's the same theme that was in 2009. Uh, so therefore, 2020 um, being here, we we benefited from all the lessons that we've learned out of 2009 and all that which we've applied um, since then. And uh, I, I will give you uh, an, an example, if I may. Um, in 2009, um, you see, when you've got a, a structural or a synchronized down to the global trade, the reality is that there are things which are within, uh, outside of your control and there are things that are within your control. Volume, 
is not within our control. The world will give you what it decides to give you. Our, our um, influence in terms of volume in so, in only, is only in so far as our ability to fine-tune our market share. Uh, case in point, in 2020, um, we are gaining market share in Melbourne. Right? That's exactly why even as Melbourne is coming down, our volumes are increasing. So it's only in so far as those are concerned. But those are which are within your control, it's really cost and capex. So going back to 2009, <clears throat> we were able to identify at that time about 16.8, I'll never forget this, about 16.8 million US dollars worth of sustainable fixed cost savings. Variable cost is, is, is easy because as your volumes come down, obviously your variables will come down, right? Whether it's royalties, utilities, uh, et al., but it's the fixed cost is where the battle is. So we've been able to identify that and um, we're trying to do the same this year in 2020. Now, um, you can imagine, uh, you know, many people have, 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 uh, who have been following I uh, have heard us, have heard me many times perhaps talking about cost management since before, even before COVID, even before the pandemic. Yeah. So therefore today in ICTSI, when we identified how we're going to be attacking our fixed costs, um, just goes to show that there is no really low hanging fruit. We identified over 200 initiatives across the entire portfolio to be able to shave off roughly about three and a half to 4% on our fixed costs. Right? So that many. Um, and, um, and, and, and what does that mean for our numbers? So again, going back to 2009, after being able to shave off about 16.8 million US dollars worth um, of cost, uh, when volumes came back in 2010, that cost did not go up. It stayed there. That's yeah. exactly why our volumes uh, uh, increased, our revenues increased, but our, but our EBITDA increased a multiple of our revenues because of the fact that we were able to keep our cost at bay, right? And we're trying to achieve that again, right? So, so uh, the entire portfolio is actually focused on working very hard to, 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 to achieve the same thing. And, and then many other things, you know, capital structure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we are not benefiting from, from all of that. Thanks, Joel. Very, very timely, you know, I mean, and, and, and very, uh, uh, and a lot of value in, in, in those words of yours. Focus in a crisis. Focus on things you, you can control, and and in this particular case, it's it's costs uh, responsibly. Um, so uh, it's all about volume and and, and sales. There's see, I mean, from your last uh, uh, report or, or or I think it, there were uh, indications. There were indications that there was a visible improvement in volume in in the month, and I think this has uh, also something to do with your diversified uh, portfolio of, of terminals uh, okay. in emerging markets and, and, and globally. Could you speak a, a little bit to that? Because, uh, sure. I mean, have we sure. bottomed already in terms of the, the volumes? In, in all? Sure. No, no, very, very good question. So um, it, 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 it's actually quite a, a very interesting anecdote. Um, the way I observed the reduction in volume over, over the portfolio um, it's really how far you are from the epicenter. Right? So as early, we had the benefit of seeing this as early as January when we saw volumes dropping significantly in, in Yantai and China. So we started asking the question. Um, and thus, by the time we got to March, we already knew um, most of what we needed to do. Um, and um, see, in, 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 in it's interesting. So uh, if you take a look at March, uh, we saw... Asia weekend, but India or Europe, Middle East, uh, and Africa uh, were still performing pretty well. As a matter of fact, for March, our volume in, in, uh, for Asia was only plus 1%, coming down from 7 and 6. EMEA was still 6, and Americas was still 8% growth. Right. April and May was when we started feeding EMEA coming down, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Latin America now uh, in May and June. Okay. And as that is happening, Asia, on the other hand, is beginning to stabilize, right? right? So uh, I, I guess the theme, um, the, the best way to, to describe this would be, we're now seeing some, I would say, 
slightly broad improvements in the Asia portfolio. But we're still seeing reductions in volume coming from our EMEA and Latin America portfolio. So if you put that together on a consolidated basis, um, you, you, you've got Asia mitigating the drops of, of uh, or the reduction in the, in the consolidated volume. And, and, and I think to answer your question directly, uh, my personal view is uh, probably second quarter probably is one we will be experiencing our bottom. Okay. Um, maybe going towards July, a lot of part of the July is in my opinion, when we can, uh, when we start seeing improvements in, in, uh, in, in the consolidated numbers. But, um, but just a few observations, okay? Uh, so uh, so with, within, um, within the quarter, uh, at, at, well, the important thing is that June seems to be shaping up better than April, okay? Um, we're seeing for certain of the terminals uh, sequential improvements in volume. If, and, and in the Philippines, is, 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 is one of those. Uh, quite important for our economy. Philippines also was where we got hit the most in so far as the portfolio is concerned. Um, because it is where we have, uh, I would say intuitively, one of the highest levels of discretionary spending. And that's what you typically lose um, in, 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 a, uh, in a global weakness. Right. Thanks, Joe. So before we go further, I think, uh, could you uh, help us understand again, what, when we talk about volume, there's transship. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what, could you very simply uh, sure. describe sure. The, the business again? So, sure, sure. Just so and, everyone and, um, can put it in the context. Yeah. Sure. So, so uh, not all terminals are the same. There are actually two types of terminals, right? So you've got what they call a transship terminal, and you what what they call our terminal, which is origin and, and destination. Think of it as a hub and spoke. So let's say June, you are sending a container container box from the UK to the Philippines. So the ship on which that box sits doesn't come directly to Manila for two reasons. A, it might not have enough throughput to justify taking the entire ship. Or B, even if it did, the depth required by the ocean liner cannot be accommodated by the small terminal in Manila. Okay. So it'll therefore have to go to a hub. When it gets to a hub or a transshipment hub, that's a transshipment port operator, the boxes are moved from an ocean liner to a feeder vessel and the feeder vessel goes to an origin or a gateway terminal. Okay, okay. So gateway terminal, origin, and end destination ports, um, feed, uh, uh, feeder terminals, they all mean the same thing. Those are all spoke. And we play only in that space, 100%. Okay? Thank you so and much. And, and, and then there are three main differences. Number one is from the perspective of yield or revenue that you generate per T of boxes. So the business model of a port operator is very simple. Whenever we move your box, you pay. Um, I mean, it's, it's not that simple, but it's almost that way. Yeah. So in, in a transshipment environment, the boxes are quote unquote moved from ship to shore to ship. And it therefore, okay. and, and it leaves. So it's three revenue okay. flows wow. per TEU of throughput. But when it gets to an end destination, the boxes are moved from ship to shore. That's one. And because it has to enter the economy, it goes to a customs process. So you are therefore at the end of the day paying storage and many other costs within the yard right. before right. the boxes are moved from the yard to the gate. So to put that in perspective, our yield per TEU is a little over $150 per TEU. PSA International, the Singapore Port Authority, has got a yield per TU of about uh, about forty three dollars per TU. So wow. that is the kind of difference in terms of yield. But they move eighty million TUs. You move ten and a half. So so that, that, that's one difference. Who who was that, Joel? At forty three dollars per TU, which would uh, PSA International, I think. No, so so PSA. that is the typical yield that that, that one generates. So um, the, the other difference is from the perspective of demand dynamics. Especially now that we're experiencing, uh, you know, worldwide economic duress. So um, when you are in a an O and D, uh, the difference between O and D and transshipment is that an O and D operator, you are servicing the requirements of your country or the jur jurisdiction in which you operate. And the only thing that passes to your ports are all consumption goods. We don't have commodities. Right. We don't right. have oil. Right. It's all. It's all consumption goods. 
A transshipment on, uh, operator, on the other hand, um, is aggregating the demand coming from all of these countries. So therefore, during periods of economic duress, yes. they are aggregating those losses. In our case, because we consistently consume and we consistently import what we consume, what you're just losing really is import from discretionary spending, brand new household goods, brand new this, brand new that. But what we need to consume is actually passing through the ports. Okay. There in lies the difference. Wow, that's a uh, yeah. That's that's uh, that's how it works. Uh, how so? What then is your? Um, could you talk about if you can share your volume expectation and uh, for for twenty twenty and twenty twenty one, if if it's possible, is it a U shape? Is it a, a V? Not a V shape, like what you said earlier. Yeah. Or is it an L shape or a W or a Nike swoosh? What do you think? And what will be the driver for the recovery? After that, you talked about yields. Can you share your view on when we can reach pre-lockdown yields? Sure, you. sure. Very good question. So, um, you know, look, look I'm, I'm not going to describe uh, any particular shape, right? Um, because, again, the world doesn't move in, 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 in that way. So from our Agreed. perspective... And the way we're looking at really is that we're going to be seeing gradual improvements in volume. The shape of that curve is going to be driven by the lockdown policies of each jurisdiction mm -hmm. in which we operate. So far, in so, in so far as the portfolio is concerned, we have experienced the strictest lockdown in the Philippines. But we are also experiencing the worst effect of disease in Latin America. So uh, thus, again, it, it is therefore now a function of how these individual governments tackle and reopen their economy. Um, so, yeah. so, so, so I think that's the way to look at it. No? Uh, from my perspective, just basically seeing, um, you know, just anecdotally as well, okay, uh, the behavior of what I've described to you occurred at a point when we were at our strictest lockdown. The fact that we are now beginning to open up the economy tells you that hopefully economic activity will begin moving. Um, and Manila is one of those countries in, or ports in which I said earlier that we're now seeing sequential improvements in volume since April. So April, May, looks like June is trending positive. Um, and and, and that, that's really important, I think, for, uh, for, for the country. So um, my, my view is that uh, maybe it might start inflecting uh, upwards perhaps in July, end of July and uh, early August. Uh, but in my opinion, similarly, it will not be steep. Uh, from a yield perspective, um, I think what's important is that if you take a look at a portfolio, uh, we are largely a regulated uh, portfolio. Thus, um, in, in, in the, typically in a regulated environment, uh, the prices are quite sticky coming down. And the reason for that is the construct of many of our concession fees, our uh, contracts, re rely heavily on variable fees that we pay government. So therefore, if we pay discounts, government will similarly uh, suffer that, no? and they do not allow that. Right? So that, therefore, is a natural mitigant to everyone yeah. fighting based yeah. on price. That's why we fight, we, we, we compete based on right. efficiency. That's actually one of the reasons why we have ICTSI as a core holding. It's because... Well, in the first place, your interests are aligned with the governments that you work with. Correct, correct. So, yes, yes, yes. Uh, that, that for me, that's huge. So, so now let's, let's shift a little bit into, uh, let's talk about, if it's okay, can we talk about risks and opportunities? Um, I mean, there's, I mean this is, sure. a, 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 I think, a golden opportunity for, for improvements and yeah. better ways of, of doing things that I think has been yeah. the common theme for this for this thread, uh, this this webcast, and so so, uh, let's talk about risks first, or maybe are these actually risks or not? So first is uh, in your in your operations, you have to constantly navigate the political environments of where you guys are are operating in, and 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 aside from that, you zoom out. There's a big picture. There's a, there's trade war. Uh, uh, is trade war escalation an issue? How is ICTSI navigating global trade tensions? Because there were global trade tensions before this 
entire thing unraveled. Uh, how about growing protectionism of major countries and the dynamics in the shipping industry? Uh, curious on your, your views there. Sure. Okay. Well, well really, uh, those are four questions. I'll start with the last first one. Sure. So, um, four questions. Uh, so, so if you take a look at our customer base, we really have two sets of customers. Um, the move between the ship and the shore are all shipping companies, and they represent about 40% of our volume, of our revenues. The rest, we deal with importers and exporters. Okay, okay now let's talk about the um, shipping companies. So, like, like what I said earlier, um, one of the, the advantages of having an OMD-focused portfolio is that unlike in a transship and oper operation, we're in, if you go to Asia, let's say uh, a shipping line goes into Asia, they can choose to go to Hong Kong, China, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, and Singapore, not to mention Singapore. When the box needs to go to the Philippines, you're typically the only game in town or any of the jurisdictions in which we operate, right? So therefore, um, even if our customers are amalgamating and therefore you have got pricing power becoming more and more concentrated with them theoretically, it is hurting more the transship and operators. In so far as the OND portfolio is concerned, you will see that our yield per TEU or the revenues that we generate per TEU of throughput is still positively slow. End of the year last year, we were generating, uh, I think our yield per TEU was roughly about 148. Um, middle of the year, we're a little over 150. So despite pricing power becoming concentrated in so far as customers are concerned, we still are able to retain that because of the nature of the O&D portfolio. That's number one. Wow. Um, second question uh, is, is uh, sorry, you, you want to help me out? Uh, what, let's go to the other questions again. Uh, so, so that was the fourth. What is the third? So this, the second was, uh, well, first was navigating global trade tensions and growing, growing protectionism and the changing dynamics of the shipping industry, which, we, which you, you talked about. So, so, so maybe, the, the talk, can you talk about the China, uh, US-China trade war? And, and I think I, I read in some literature that there's actually a US-Russia trade war happening as well. Uh, could you, could you yeah, uh, correct, speak correct. a bit about well, that? And then let's talk supply chain after, yeah. Sure, no, so very, very important, uh, global trade war, but, but uh, it, it's quite interesting, right? Um, if you take a look at the stats, the global trade, there's really no global trade war. There is a trade war occurring between China and the US, right? And, um, and if you take a look at our portfolio, with the exception really of China, uh, we are nowhere any of those, uh, we're not part of it. We are indirectly affected by it because as the, as the global or the trade war worsens, then it also affects confidence and it thus affects consumption. So it only affects us indirectly in that way. So again, last year was the high, at the height of the global war, uh, trade war, uh, quote unquote, we still grew by about six, 7%. Right? So we uh, are less affected by it, right? Now, um, how do we navigate political risk? I, I think that is probably one of the key um, uh, important considerations, right? So if you take a look at it, uh, you know, we don't buy political risk insurance. Uh, political risk is innate in the entire portfolio. Okay? We operate in emerging and frontier economies. Um, and then similarly, uh, developed economies like Australia. Okay? But what is the common thread amongst all of those is that they're all origin and, and destination driven. Now, um, in managing political risk very specifically, uh, we look at it in, in different steps. And, and, you know, you have to bear with me a bit because I'm, I'm quite passionate about this. Um, it actually really... starts, it starts in the construct of your bid, okay? Um, if you bid a very fixed, a, a, a fixed cost all the way, and even if it's significantly high, giving you, you know, uh, quite a, a hefty present value, uh, the reality is that you are there for 25 years paying a fixed rate, and therefore you might be friendly only for the first two regimes, but once you get on your 20th, 15th to 20th year, and you're generating significant revenues, but you're only sharing the same fixed fees that you paid government since yeah. 15 years ago, I think it opens you up to political risk. Right? So therefore, we put a very big um, uh, emphasis on variable fees. 
right? So, so therefore, our interests are aligned all throughout. Right. Speaking of political risk, and and you operate in countries where there is, uh, there uh, there's sometimes there's turmoil, right? So, so uh, you also had. Uh, could you give us an update on Sudan? Um, is that something you can you can? Sure. Yeah. So you know, uh, Sudan, we continue to have a constructive uh, conversations with them. Um, the uh, we've got two contracts with them. One is what they call the refund bond. The concession agreement is still in place. Uh, they are supposed to be returning funds to us under the refund bond, which is separate from the concession agreement. Um, they've returned uh, about 210, 220 uh, million euros. And the balance we are hoping to be able to settle uh, by the end of the year. Whether um, it's in kind, i.e. taking over partially, perhaps, or getting our cash back. So that, those are the conversations that are currently uh, on. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. Uh, let's move into supply chain uh, right now. So, so does, uh, do, do you think the, the Philippines and ASEAN will benefit from, from uh, supply chain relocation out of China? And how does that impact, impact you? And sure. Maybe I'll pair that with another question so you can just go and answer it. What does the government need? If so, what does the government policy need? How does the government policy need to change so the Philippines can fully capitalize on supply chain relocation in that sense and replicate the experience in a country from, from, of a country like Vietnam, which has you know, been the darling of, of, uh, of, of, of these uh, um, outsourcers? Sure. No, thanks for that. So... Um... Uh, with this de-risking going on with uh, with China, uh, it really presents you know quite significant opportunities for the countries in which you operate. Uh, in a sense that um, many of the uh, the big demand, perhaps, or, or, or the many of the large corporations, rather, rather than setting up in China or continuing with their setup in China, they might regionalize and not necessarily insource, but basically get their sourcing much nearer them. So, in my opinion. Uh, countries, uh, certain countries in Latin America will benefit from it as a result of demand coming from uh, the U.S. instead of the China-U.S. routes, uh, perhaps manufacturing and sourcing would be coming from Mexico, for example. Uh, in so far as ASEAN is concerned, I think it will be a big beneficiary for it. Uh, in so far as the Philippines is concerned, I think there are certain challenges that we um, are currently facing at the moment, which perhaps uh, are giving investors some pause, for example, um, in, in uh, putting and committing here. I think uh, one of which might be, uh, they want to see how perhaps this uh, COVID or this pandemic management will play out, right? Um, you know, the government is dealing with very limited resources. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's trying its best, but as a foreign investor, and if they're going to be relocating here, uh, they need to ensure that, indeed, what is being put in place uh, can actually sustain whatever it is that they're going to be putting in here. And, so, and, um, and, and I think it'll take a little bit more time uh, for them to, uh, to, to observe further. Other countries have gotten that, uh, I think, down to a path. So Vietnam, for example, have been able to not solve it, but at least control. Um, and similarly, Myanmar, similarly, have been able to control the spread. Uh, I think in our case, we've got a little bit more homework and a little bit more work to do in so far as government's concerned. I think cost of electricity also needs to adjust. Um, I also think that um, the, uh, I would say the, uh, the commitment of government to honor contracts, you know, uh, whether by way of tariff um, adjustments uh, that they had promised prior PPP developers, uh, that they should be delivering on those. Um, and, and, and I also think that if they can also just, um, uh, uh, well, build, build, build is a very important uh, project. And, and, and I think that that, that needs to continue. Uh, and in my opinion, many, uh, many aspects actually relying upon that build, build, build program uh, to push the GDP growth back up. It's actually similar to what you said early on on the cons consumption drive. I mean, the solution yeah. is through spending. Uh, I have one last question, important question for me to you, and then I'll open it up to Q and A because I think we've I've asked too many questions already. I need to open it up. Um, my last question for now is: Has the disruption opened up opportunities? We're talking about risks, quasi opportunities, uh, inter and and what's the strategy here? Is it expansion? Is it M and A? Are you presented with 
uh, you know, uh, deals you can't talk, uh, I mean. Sure. No, no, good question. Look, it, it, it's interesting, right? The strategy actually doesn't change. Um, you know, COVID to us uh, is, is a bump in the road. Uh, and um, are there opportunities that are, that are, are that have arisen as a result of this? Not yet. Those which were in an M&A uh, situation before have simply held back and are postponing those discussions. Uh, countries uh, which have started their privatization um, have basically similarly held back on their announcements uh, until things improve. Uh, but having said that, in my opinion, if globally the economy worsens, world economy worsens, in my opinion, there might be opportunities that might arise. So the, 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 op the, the flip side of that is governments who will need the cash may accelerate their privatization exercise so that they can get it front end and use it in their fight against COVID or to use it in their respective recoveries. So what's key basically is making sure that the balance sheet um, is, is ready for that. And you know, the 400 million US dollar issue that we did recently is really part of that strategy. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. So uh, our CEO, Mike Ferrer, wants to uh, ask a question, I think. Is Mike, is Mike here? Let's, let's uh, jumpstart the Q&A. Well, uh, while, while Mike's waiting to get in, um, is he here? Yeah, maybe June, I can, we can just ask one of the, uh, okay. I think he's been promoted now. He's been promoted. Mike, congrats on the promotion. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, yeah, you can. Please go ahead. Yeah. So while Mike's getting it ready, uh, would like to ask you about, um, while Mike's getting on the, uh, he's still trying to get on the space, I'd like to ask you about digital innovation. Uh, okay. How much of a role is uh, digital innovation in terms of supply chains uh, and with your operation? Is there a shift to you know, ops heavy, tech light to, to uh, tech heavy, ops light? Is that meaningful for your operation? No, no, it, it certainly is. No? So um, especially similarly from the perspective of COVID yeah, and, and what we need to do for the uh, with, with regard to the pandemic. So uh, in, the, in uh, Melbourne, for example, we are fully automated um, and uh, thus, our adjustment in relation to pandemic to the pandemic wasn't really there wasn't really so much nothing really to adjust in reality um, as compared to our competitors we are one, running a million TU capacity with about 128 people as compared to our neighbors running it with about 700 to about 800 people so that alone uh, is a very important uh, differentiator um, Yes, it is important, but it's ba basically important in terms of bits of that supply chain. Okay? So there is no one single solution that could automa automate that entire supply chain. So hence, a uh, blockchain, in my opinion, I think would be very important. Um, albeit there are many experiments that are ongoing. Nobody, no single uh, player has emerged that is interesting enough for the entire industry to, lock, to latch on. So... Um, neither do we want to be first movers when, when it comes to blockchain uh, in so far as uh, ICSI is concerned. So we look at the, uh, the, the digital space uh, from the perspective similarly of security. Um, and, and, I, and I can confirm that um, those that have affected uh, our uh, competitors recently um, and uh, you know, lost significant amounts of money, we can confirm that our system would have been able to catch that. Uh, so through, you know, uh, we've got uh, AI-driven uh, uh, security platforms across the entire portfolio. Uh, similarly, uh, optimizing uh, well digital systems to be able to move cash much better. One of the things that we're seeing right now, um, one of the things that we're benefiting from, is a shift, like a big shift from uh, cash to online payment. Uh, so where before, you saw people literally making payments in the terminal. But as a result of this, many of them are now uh, hopping towards uh, online payments. Uh, and, and similarly, the relationship with customs, similarly going on online platforms, that has got a long-term effect uh, on capacity uh, movement within terminal and the ability to accommodate bigger volumes without the need to spending more capex. Thank you, Joel. Philip, you wanted to ask a question or is Mike ready to um, jump in? 
Yeah, June. Um, well, look, Michael asked the last question. I think I want to just maybe ask some questions that have come from the floor. Um, there is a question here about, you know, I guess managing from the organization standpoint. And the question is about uh, identifying uh, weak points in a company. Um, you know, have you, have you, when you come into a crisis, are you able to identify these? How does the board and management respond to that type of a situation? And, uh, um, and how does that change your planning uh, towards the future? I, I don't know if weak points is the right word. I, I think it could be weak points. It also could be, as June pointed out, opportunities. Um, that's one question. And maybe the second question before we go to the last question um, uh, from Mike is just a question about the Philippine government's recovery package, uh, whether we think it's adequate or not. Um, and would you want to see maybe more incentives um, uh, provided? Uh, these are kind of two questions from the floor. Sure. Th thanks for that, uh, Phil. Okay. So, um, you know, so far as weak points and opportunities are concerned, really, um, you know, re resilience is should not built overnight. So we, we have been building our financial and corporate resilience over time. And when this thing hit, um, it was really just a matter of being able to adjust uh, because we already had all our systems in place. Work from home really did not affect us operationally. Um, and uh, really, I, I, I was impressed with the ability of the organization to pivot, no? and uh, not just to be able to react, but to base, but really to be able to take steps. No? So, like for example, once they announced the lockdown, the first thing that we did um, was we announced a pause in our capex. Immediately, everyone undertook a tactical review, a tactical capex review. Um, immediately, they, they they drew upon uh, the uh, half of our uh, bank lines, um, you know, and, and being able to build up our our liquidity. So, uh, again, being able to react uh, swiftly in these situations is actually, um, I, I must say, quite, uh, quite important and quite critical uh, in, the, in, in the survival and growth of the company. Um, we have had, uh, I would say, significantly more intense in contact with the board since. Um, obviously, the communication with the chairman uh, is, is, uh, is, is actually quite seamless. We run our terminals federally, right? Uh, therefore, they are able to react quite fast um, and they don't have to take instructions from uh, central, centrally speaking. Uh, but having said that, they work within a set of rules uh, and KPIs, uh, which are monitored very strictly at the level of parents. So that, that kind of uh, matrix uh, arrangement uh, gives everyone the ability to pivot and react pretty, and, and, and react pretty fast. So. Uh, I, we've had really no problems um, apart from volumes weakening uh, in so far as this crisis is concerned. Thanks, Joe. Just a second question Thank on you, the Joel. government uh, response. Sure. Uh, Philippine, you know, uh, I, I think they're doing what they can. Okay. Um, and uh, the, the reality is that, uh, is that ad adequate enough? Look, they haven't even passed create. Right? What Congress needs to do is to pass the law. And once they pass the law, all of these will be triggered. Then we will know whether it's enough or not, right? Uh, and, and, you know, that's the best answer as I could give. They need to pass create law. Thank you. June? Uh, June, are you on there still? Um... Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm on, Phil. Uh... You can send the last question over to I think Joel is Joel still? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mike. Hi, hi Joel, can you hear me? I can hear you well, Mike. Yeah, I Mike here. Well, first thanks again for being on this webinar. Uh and uh congratulations on a, on a great career and uh congratulations to ICTSI on how uh, successfully weathering this whole uh crisis and your, your bond offering, of course, uh, helps you put, uh, put yourselves in a better stead. Um, I, 
my question is actually more a personal question because I know you're a markets guy at the end, you know, at heart. Um, so as they say, you know, every, every crisis uh, creates opportunities and we shouldn't let it go to waste. So just wanted to get your views maybe and uh, what, what does your personal portfolio look like? your asset allocation, and uh, any advice to the investors out there? Sure, sure. No, no, thanks for that. Uh, first of all, let me, let, uh, let me predicate this by uh, saying that your guess is as good as mine. Okay. <laughs> but but uh, no, um, seriously, uh, I, I, I think um, infrastructure assets uh, are, are, you know, are, are key in my opinion. Uh, so, so, so far as my personal portfolio is concerned, obviously I've got a significant amount of ICTSI in my uh, uh, personal portfolio, uh, but you, but all the other uh, infra companies as well, um, and, and and I think just because of the nature of, of their business, no? so uh, from a balance sheet perspective, cash flow perspective, and the ability to step that up uh, when markets reopen, I I think in Philippine infrastructure companies are very well placed uh, to be able to. Um, deliver significant value on a long-term basis. So whether it's Metro Pacific, Ayala, et al., um, I, I think they will be significant value drivers uh, for the index going forward. Thanks, Joel. Thank you. So again, just like that, an hour flying by very fast and not enough time. Maybe we can have a part two at some point. Joel, just want to recognize you again for showing up and thank you for all of your your insights, especially on, the, on, on emphasizing the things that we can control rather than the things that we can't. And uh, for just being very, uh, um, very uh, uh, attuned to, to the, the plight of, of the, the, the businessman, the small businesses as well um, with, with, your, with your drive. Um, and uh, yeah, ICTSI remains a core part of our portfolios, equity portfolios, uh, particularly because we, we like the, uh, we, we, you score particularly high uh, on our management scorecard and um, you also, we think there's meaningful value at this point. Uh, at this point. So um, thanks again, Joel. Um, yeah. Joel, thank you very much. Yeah, you know, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, again, I wish everyone um, well, and uh, I really hope that uh, you stay, everyone stay healthy and, and similarly with, uh, with your family. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Jun. Salamat. Salamat then. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Phil.